Well, thanks, Bill and John, for, for joining me today on a, uh, a interesting topic. I do love beer. Me and my wife, every time we travel uh, in America and now around the world, as we, as we love abroad, we, we, we go to as many breweries as we can, and we, and we really enjoy having having a nice craft beverage, usually. So I, I am... I am a fan of, of sort of the what's come along as the craft industry and, and sort of breweries and the craftsmanship behind it. Um, but I also understand that there's there's another side of it that, you know, we all know and see throughout our lives. And, you know, I have personal people in my family that have struggled with alcoholism, have struggled with sort of the the other side of, of alcohol, right? And we kind of know what those things are. I, I think here we are trying to figure out ways to, to improve that for society at a local level, at a global level. So obviously getting talk getting to talk to you guys about sort of research that's going on. Let's just touch on sort of the project in general, maybe go over the high level of, of what the mission was with sort of the report and the study, and maybe what the mission was at, at just the top end. Grant, thanks. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you. And look, I love the way you contextualize this this discussion, which is about, you know, what is it as a lover of beer? What is it about beer that draws, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of people and throughout the course of history, right? Mm -hmm. That this is not something that's new or recent. This is part of who we are as people. This is a part of what brings us together. This is a part of innovation. This is a part of bonding moments. This is a part about celebration. This is a part about when you say grab a beer, you know, what do you mean by that, right? Mm -hmm. Is to talk about, you know, the moments in life where you want to bond with someone, the moments in life where you want to share with someone. But as you say, what we also have in connection with alcohol is what do we do about the harmful use? And mm -hmm. what is it that we, particularly as a, a leading beer company all around the world can do? And if I can answer your question directly, it's about what about the science, right? Mm. So much of what we've done over the years, over the decades has been, let's do some harmful use reduction programs. And we think we know what works and let's try that. So we think we know what works and we're going to try safe rides home. We think we know what works and it's going to be an education campaign. We think we know what works. Well, you know, we woke up one day and we said, we think we know this works, but what actually works? Mm -hmm. And the only way to find out what actually works is to let others measure you, is to let others have a baseline, is to let others show you what it is you do well and what it is you don't do well and you need to keep your eyes open but most importantly you need to find the right people right you need to find the right people who are going to tell it to you straight who are not you're not going to interfere with they're going to look at it they're going to measure it and they say this is how you're doing this is what you're doing so it was about transparency it was about measurement it was about how you measure and it was about the insights that come from that and that's why we were so fortunate to have someone like bill novelli and the georgetown business for impact team take a look at what we were doing and provide that viewpoint and to tell us, right, what we can do better, right? And this is really what we were looking for. We wanted them to give their unfiltered, unvarnished view. And that's why it was so great to have them tell us, this is what's working. This isn't what's working. This is what you can do better. And really for us to listen. Bill, do you want to jump in and kind of talk about what, what you found and maybe where, where was the starting point, I guess, on, on all this? Well, I think the starting point was uh, just what, what John was talking about. In other words, this is a, this is a marketing powerhouse, AB mm -hmm. InBev. Many, many brands in many countries. And, um, you know, for, for a company like this to take on a project and to say, okay, let's be totally unvarnished. Let's figure out what's working. What, what exactly does that take? First of all, I think it takes courage. It takes courage for a company to stand up. Secondly, uh, they invested. They invested a lot of money in responsible drinking. And as John said, in measurement, in analysis, in strategy. And those, those strategies are important. And this is a strategic uh, company. Uh, the other thing, though, Grant, is um, you know, company culture is very important. And what, what we saw when we undertook this study was that um, the C-suite, the people like John and people at the top, the CEO, uh, these, these people had commitment. And without that, you're not going to really make a lot of progress. And then they put an executive in charge, a senior person in charge, Kata Garcia. So you take all those things and put them together, and then you got a good chance at making change. When I was reading over you know, harmful drinking, safe drinking, there were some of the really the overall big topics. How do we measure harmful like drinking? Is that, is it, is it different in different countries, how you measure that? Like, again, talking about the science, how do we know if, you know, people are big, people are small, people are wide, people are skinny, like there, there's alcohol consumption can come in different ways and affect people differently, of course. How do we measure or understand harmful drinking at, at such a scalable level? 
Grant, I love the question because this is what, you know, had our head scratching when we started this project, right? We mm -hmm. said, wow, what is it we're going to do here, right? Is this, or are we going to go into things that are micro about individual behaviors about what is harmful drinking for a particular individual? Or how do we measure from a societal standpoint? that what's happening here. And they're really two are related, right? Because the individual, right? How that individual relates to alcohol, how that individual uses alcohol is what forms, right? The study that we're doing. But what we did was we, we stepped back and we said, let's get a baseline. How do we measure what the impact of alcohol is? Let's go mm -hmm. take a look at what's the best science out there. And there's this concept in the public health community. And this was something where we really reached out to, right? We wanted to hear from our critics and the public health community to say, what is there about the the harmful use of alcohol, right? When people abuse it, how does that impact society and how do you measure that? Mm -hmm. So what we did was we had projects, for instance, on something like drunk driving, right? So if you think about all the work that we have done over the years, and I really am proud to be part of Anheuser-Busch in the U.S., where they've been doing, you know, anti-drunk driving campaigns for decades and one, or was one of the first to do it. And then we took that learning and expanded around the world. But what does that mean, right? What does that mean for society? What does that mean for people who use the roads? And I always try to make this analogy to folks to say, look, I don't go to Mars and come back here during the workday and go use the roads, right? My family uses the roads. My kids ride their bikes on the roads. I use the roads. We're all on those roads. So this is my problem. This is what we're impacted. And how do you measure that? So when we looked at drunk driving, we said, what about road safety? How do you improve? Because drunk driving is one of the impacts on road safety. What about text messaging? What about the use of data, right, to make sure that those intersections or those parts of the road where accidents are repeatedly happening, how do we make sure we measure that? And drunk driving, of course, was part of that. So what we did was we worked with local tra traffic associations. We wrote, worked with local NGOs. We worked with local bars. We worked with a whole number of folks to say, how can we systematically measure that? And the reason I use road safety is you have data on the use mm -hmm. of roads. So if you're going to measure drunk driving accidents, it's a little more tangible and easier for folks to understand, wow, now I know how many drunk driving accidents there are. Now, now I know how many uh, incidents there were on the road that led to harm. But we also looked at it as far as something called with the public health community, what they call healthy years of living. So what's the impact of abusing alcohol? What's the impact of binge drinking? Mm -hmm. What's the impact of having a frequency of the use of alcohol over the long term? We know the immediate harm. Mm -hmm. We know if you go crash your car, but what's the long term harm? And we looked at that too. Because the programs that we looked at, we wanted to have a more holistic view. So we worked with outside experts and we said, you measure us. You tell us what's the best measurement to do this. Then let's take a baseline. Then let's run our program. And then let's see what happened. On road safety, it's easy to see, right? You go take mm -hmm. a look and you say, wow, so what were, the, what were the road accidents, right? What were the harms that came from the road use before you started this program? And then after you started this program. And that's what we're really looking to measure. Yeah. When John said, uh, you know, lay down a baseline, abuse of alcohol uh, can be a common occurrence across countries, but mm -hmm. it can also differ across countries. So uh, they did two things that I thought were, were really important. One is they brought in the public health community and they brought in the public health community uh, really to advise them not to varnish or whitewash anything, but to lay it down. And they also brought in a third party evaluator. Uh, and that third party evaluator did the baseline and then did measurements over time. So, for example, in Mexico, selling alcohol to minors was a problem. So hmm. they tried to address that and they tried to measure it. In South Africa, it might be different. In the United States, it might be different. These are essentially common problems, but with cultural and practical differences across countries. So that made it complicated. Yeah. And some of the in reading over sort of the report, there was kind of some big topics that you wanted to sort of look at and say, here are some things we can do that that maybe can improve things. And one was sort of, you know, marketing and, and sort of campaigning and, and changing a culture is very, very difficult, right? Like we have so many cultures, even, you know, just in America and now living abroad, there's even more everywhere you go. So how do we look at, you know, marketing, especially InBev, I mean, massive, massive company, $89 billion market cap, I think the last time I checked. So the ability to sort of market and shift cultures in certain things is actually kind of possible just because, you know, you're the biggest and it, it, you kind of have a lot of momentum and in, in, in where you spend dollars, you can really differ things. What does that look like? And what does the data say if that was really looked at hardcore? What does that say on how maybe marketing and changing sort of campaigns around harmful drinking? How can that 
part be improved? Grant, I love the question because it was one of the big insights when we started this project about there were a lot of things we could do, right? But Mm -hmm. one of the main things that was in our control, Mm -hmm. that is the power of what we do, the expertise that we bring is brands and marketing. And the concept of social norm marketing, right, was something that we really leaned into. And we got the public health experts and the experts on social norms to say, if you can, right, get out right to people so they understand right what the social norm is for something so you often see the classic example of kids in college right who think that well everyone's going out and binge drinking so i should binge drink well the social norm is that is not happening so if you can get a message out about what you think the social norm is and what actually is what's happening that is a true mover of individual and therefore social behavior so the way that translates for us is the power of our brands to let people know actionable messages to let people know about things that may seem sort of very vague like what does responsibility mean how do you Mm -hmm. translate that we translate Mm -hmm. that into social norm marketing where we literally have now a competition where we bung our brands, we have 500 plus brands all around the world and we have a competition and we say, we want your best social norm marketing. And the winner is gonna get tens of millions of dollars to spend upon your brand for that campaign. And what it leads to is brands that make an impact on the communities that they have. So we did a brand in, 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 uh, in, we have a brand in Colombia called Aguila, right? And Aguila, right, is a brand that is loved in Colombia. And what Mm -hmm. we did was we said, look, Let's do something what we call under the caps. We gave the caps of every beer bottle to folks like convenience restaurants to say, make sure you eat before and while you drink, because that's an action, Mm -hmm. right? That will reduce, right? Potential harmful use of a very simple message, right? The beauty of social norms is you're not trying to send someone to class and get them a PhD, right? What you're trying to do is change their behavior in a way that benefits. So we gave the caps, we put like, you know, restaurants and water, and then we had coupons underneath to say, go get a free hamburger, go get a free water, make sure you hydrate, space your drinks, eat before and while you drink. And they may seem like simple messages, but we tested those messages. We worked with academic institutions to say, give us the best messages. That's what we want that changes behavior because those acts and the use of the brands changes people's daily behavior as opposed to putting up a sign that says, act responsibly. Man, like (laughs) one thing we know is that doesn't work, right? And it doesn't work as well as making sure that that social norm science is embedded in a simple actionable way through the power of what we do. And by the way, the same team that runs our brand to sell it runs our social marketing, right? So we want the A team. And that was one of the key insights for us. You need the A team right on there to make sure that it's not just a campaign. And this is one of the true insights, right? That Georgetown gave us, right? It was put it as part of your DNA. It's not about Mm -hmm. one in and one out. And hey, and that's a challenge to us. We welcome the challenge, but we love the insight. In other words, saying, okay, great on these campaigns, but you know what? You need to do better, right? You need to embed this in what you do. Man, that's a challenge for us, but it's a challenge we welcome. You know, Grant, um, my background is marketing. Um, mm-hmm. I started I started at Unilever. And so for a long time, I was in commercial marketing and then social marketing, as John said. And one of the things I believe is that marketing is a really powerful discipline. Very. And when you take all these brands and you do the research locally and you apply them to norm change, uh, you're going to make a difference. But the question is, is it a long-term difference? Can you use brand marketing to change long-term social norms? Hmm. And really, the jury is still out on that. But the other thing I'm hopeful about is I, I want other companies to see this. I want other companies to see that this is a sweet spot where you can build social strategies into your core business. Hopefully, AB InBev, by doing what they're doing, is going to move the whole market. Uh, I want to touch on something that, that you said a little bit, John, with, with sort of the caps and sort of discount codes on certain things. And the thing that popped into my mind was really leveraging technology, right? Whether it's the Apple Watch, whether it's an app or your phone, like you said, the codes on there for discounts for Lyft or Uber. Because I think a, a lot of things are avoidable. We talk about you know the road issue and, and sort of drunk driving. Now the tools are in place where these things can be 
you know, limited by, a, I mean, that those statistics can drastically, drastically drop if, you know, at, at every point in time, maybe, you know, it's an app where it alerts you every time, every 20 minutes to have a glass of water or something, if you're drinking, right? Maybe, I don't know, the Apple health watch can, can tell your blood alcohol level, right? And say, Hey, you need a glass of water or something like that. I, I feel like we're on the precipice perhaps of, of a way to improve, improve sort of the health and, and safety just with technology around sort of, you know, to not get to that harmful drinking stage in a, in a person's evening or night. It's, it's great insight because what we do, right, as a company and what we do in the, in the private sector, in the commercial sector as a global company is have the ability to scale. So mm -hmm. you can take a program that works for your neighborhood, for your block, right? But what does that mean to scale? How can you get that message out? Technology is a, a, a critical part of that, as well as partnerships. One of the things that we learned, and we did a, a series of pilots around the world. We did six pilots uh, in, in different continents around the world to test, and we tried to test different programs. And one of the key insights that we had is that we can have what we think might be the best thing in the world, and it doesn't work, right, mm -hmm. unless you partner with the folks on the ground, unless you partner with local governments, unless you partner with NGOs, unless you partner with the community that we are a part of. And remember, we don't we don't make our beer in, in one brewery, you know, in right. St. Louis and ship it all around the world. Man, we we brew locally. 98% of what we brew is is there. We work with the farmers locally, mm. just like we need to work with the local community. And technology is part of that. So you talked about Uber and Lyft. Man, what a tremendous, tremendous benefit, right, that mm -hmm. they provide for us as well, right? But technology also for us is about scale. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Bill had mentioned about different problems in different countries. So one of the things that technology, I think, is potentially really impactful is, you know, in the U.S., you may, when you go for your annual physical, oftentimes the, the doctor will ask you, so how much do you drink? And you'll have a series of questions about that. That's something called... Uh, a screening brief intervention. And based on your answers of that, your doctor will have actionable advice for you. Well, if you go to other countries, the doctors might be so hard pressed for time mm. that they don't have time to ask those types of questions, right? They, they just, it's not built into what they have in the system. So what we did was we said, if we could get a chat bot, right, to work with folks who oftentimes have phones, right? And we can say, look, Here's something from the doctor's office or the, or the doctor themselves or the, or the physician's assistant. If we can go ask those questions in a way, is there a benefit to that, that people who aren't being asked those questions, their doctor and their doctor's office can then go do that. We've tested that in, in Mexico. We are now trying to scale that up in other markets to continue to test it. Early results look good, but damn, again, we're transparent. Mm -hmm. We want to see the results. We want to make sure it works. But something as simple of the, as that, right? The institution of a chatbot to provide that type of advice about your relationship with alcohol and actionable advice that comes from it. So we test, does it work if the doctor says it? Well, what if the, the nurse says it? What if the physician's assistant says it? Well, what if you just get a notice from the doctor's office? Is that enough to change people's behavior? And that's what we're working on. But if you can take that individual doctor and now expand it out to everyone who's going to the doctor, that's what scale is all about. Yeah, I mean, I think John really put his finger on it, uh, the idea of testing. This is, a, this is a big company, but a very agile company. And most companies can move fast, way faster than public health uh, mm -hmm. or the government, certainly. Yeah. So what we have here is a differential in terms of speed. So AB InBev will test something and they'll go on to something else and they'll find what works and they'll keep at it and keep at it. Meanwhile, the public health community is talking in years. Yeah. So you've got this uh, and the government is talking in decades. So you've got this differential in terms of agility and in terms of timing. And I think one of the challenges for John and for the company was to figure that out. Another interesting topic that, you know, I don't, I don't know, John, if you thought you'd ever be talking about maybe in your career working at InBev, but is, is the non-alcoholic beverage industry ha has really sort of kind of taken off a little bit in the last, let's, I don't know, let's say three to five years. And I mean, you obviously have more, more data than I do, but it, it feels like that just from a consumer level. What, what is that power in that? Is that provide then the ability for the marketing dollars to adjust to a different product suite within the embed portfolio to where people maybe, you know, turn to that if they can, or uh, again, it, there seems like it's, it's a positive societal shift just in the ability of low alcohol content beer and then non-alcoholic beverages. It really is. And it's, 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 it's very much an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about how much we 
spend in our resources and time to understand consumers, what consumer trends are, where consumers are going. When you take a look at the appetite for low alcohol and no alcohol beers, you see consumers with this health and wellness trend. And how can mm -hmm. we tap into that? And what does that mean for us? Really, when you take a look at it, it's about providing those consumers that choice and that availability, right? Mm -hmm. For folks yeah. to say, you know what? I'm going to you know, be out tonight. I'm going to be celebrating. And you know what? I'm going to maybe space my drinks with a Budweiser and then a Budweiser Zero, mm -hmm. right? And for mm -hmm. us, man, we love that. That's fantastic, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. we want to provide to the consumer, right? What the consumer wants and on that occasion. And in addition, it meets the public health goals as well, right? Of providing choice, of trying to make sure that people have that ability to have the experience with alcohol that they're looking for, right? So we want them to have that positive experience, right? We want them to have that bonding moment, right? Without the negative effects that if they binge or if they overindulge, right? We want to be able to provide that for them. And one of the insights that we had too is that it was very powerful, right? If we made sure that we had our core brand also has mm -hmm. a zero mm -hmm. or low alcohol alternative, mm -hmm. because what people do is, right? It's much easier for their, for their experience to go and say, I'm going to go space this. I'm going to go put this into my, into my uh, consumption pattern about I'm going to go in and now incorporate low alcohol or no alcohol beer. And, you know, one of the great things about the low alcohol option is, right, when you're talking about, you know, a 3.5 or a 3.2% mm -hmm. beer, mm -hmm. right, this is something where people are getting what they want out of the product. They're getting that bond and moaning. They're getting that experience, right? But they're also very much in consumer trend of control. Right. They're also they're also looking after things that don't have to do with the alcohol content, but have to do with low carbs and low calories. Right. right? This is something that that they're looking for. And they're getting the taste profile. All right. They're they're getting what they want of that product. And 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 for me, it's about listening to that consumer, you know, listening to saying, what is it about that experience? And what we've seen is that low alcohol, no alcohol beer market is at different phases. And Bill, I want to kind of ask you a question about doing the study. Did, did you or your team, did, did you come across anything that was a little bit eye-opening or a little bit shocking that maybe you didn't realize was was happening in the world, whether it was from you know a, a data perspective or certain parts of the world that shocked you of, of harmful consumption versus safe consumption? Like, Was there anything that really jumped out to you guys when you were doing the research? Well, you know, we had worked with um, AB InBev for about five years before we undertook the study, and we've done a lot of work around the world. So I, I wouldn't say there were any real shock. You know, it, it's very clear that you have to understand local markets, and as he said, to adapt to them. But I think we came up with some recommendations that, um, that John and his people found helpful. You know, they've done a lot of partnership, including with the public health community. Uh, but what we recommended was they, they really need to, I think, deepen those partnerships and expand them. And, and for companies, um, you know, that takes a certain amount of, of skill and a certain amount of courage. We also uh, said that, you know, they, they, had, they have good goals. They've laid out good social change, social norm goals, but they can combine them. And so we, we came up with some recommendations that uh, we hope will be, will be helpful to the company going forward. Uh, but I don't think we came up with any, uh, anything really shocking. What we came up with was a company making progress uh, to the degree possible they, they want to and they need to accelerate that progress. And as I said before, from a Georgetown standpoint, from our standpoint, we want other companies to emulate this one. When you talk about public partnerships, what does that look like? And how can those be deepened? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, Grant. Um, over the years, what we've discovered is a lot of companies shy away mm -hmm. from doing partnerships with, let's say, civil society, with nonprofits, with NGOs. And they think, you know, these people are a bunch of tree huggers. They, they don't. <laughs> They don't understand what we're trying to do. And on the other side, you get these public health people saying, oh, we can't deal with companies. Right. You know, these, all these people care about is profit. Right. But the truth of the matter is that the big social and environmental challenges that we face in this world, they're way too big for endless combat. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why AB InBev is so encouraging, because they're willing to cross the aisle. Let's like, say in a perfect world, let's say like five years from now, maybe. Like, what is, what is an example of something that could happen or that would be welcomed on on sort of both sides, and you know we don't have to get into policy here and stuff like that. But is there is there something maybe it hasn't it hasn't been thought of yet? But is there something out there that in a perfect world it really would 
something partnership wise would be really, really powerful that you can think of? You know, partnering with some organizations like WHO, like with the United Nations and their social development goals, all, all these different areas that are that take time, that take yeah. uh, diplomacy, if you will. Uh, th these are all good. Uh, when I think about partnerships, I, I often talk about strange bedfellows. In other words, partnering with people you wouldn't normally think of huh. as, a, um, as an ally. Um, and uh, to me, there, there's no permanent enemies, there's no permanent friends, there's only permanent principle and permanent values. You know, when I think about it, you know, I think of the work that we've done in connection with traffic authorities around the world, and there's different names about how it's regulated. Yeah. But when you go take a look at that, right, what we were talking to them about was a number of different programs, and it was really about management techniques to access the data that municipalities and localities mm -hmm. already had. They have a right? ton. They, have a, they have a ton, but they weren't talking to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits that we could bring, right, was an expertise to say, let's tap into these different data pools. Let's draw out the insights in a going forward basis so you can see where to make changes, so you can react quickly, so you can see what's working, what the insights are, that you already have the data there. So, you know, you know things that were like for roads, right, on road safety. So it was like, what's the combination of free ride programs and anti-drunk driving campaigns along with, you know, things like weather patterns, right, along with mm. things like flooding on roads, along things like road design. So if you can change the bend of that road or if during storms sand would come onto the road, make it simply so two days later, how do all these things interact? And it seems like a, a difficult, complex problem but that's exactly what it is because that's what life is like, right? Mm -hmm. It's about you can't pick and choose, right, what the impact is that's going on. You need to draw out what the impact is. You can't say, well, I'm just going to focus in on drunk driving and that's it. Man, you want a comprehensive road safety program. You want to work with the data from the traffic authorities. You want to work with the data from the bars about what are their hours, what's their beverage service. Are they making sure that they're not serving customers who they shouldn't be serving? All those things come together, and the proof is in the data at the end when you measure, so what were the road incidents this time and what were the causes? And that's the beauty of what's going on here because we can't do it. No matter how many campaigns we run, we can't have that type of impact. We need the local tavern authorities. We need traffic authorities. We need the local tavern association. We need the local NGOs. We mm. need all those folks to have that real impact. And, it, you know, is it complicated? Yes. Is it worth doing? 1,000% yes, because it's the way you make real change in towns and localities. And the other thing is you take a look at things like, once you know, what do you do with it? So we have all this great <laughs> learning for yeah. traffic and road safety. Well, great. You know, I can, I can shout it from the rooftop of our Budweiser brewery in St. Louis, and it's not really going to matter. So what we did was we worked with the United Nations, right? We walked to the United Nations Institute of Training and Research. They have outposts all around the world. And we said, you know what? We're going to share with you the data. We're going to share with you the best practices. You take a look at it. If you think that this is worth in your, in your view of sharing around so that municipalities in South America can have it, in Africa can have it, in, in Europe can have it, in the Americas, Asia, all those areas that you support through your program, again, this is what scale. It's not just about the no. private scale. It's about the scale that's already there and tapping into it. And what we did was we said, look, here's the data. This is what the outside experts said. Here are the learnings. And we put that up through the UNITAR, the United Nations Institute of Training and Research, and said, make this available. So if you are right in a town in Africa, you can tap into that. If you are in a town in Ecuador and you're the mate, you can tap into that road mm -hmm. safety toolkit. You can do that and take the learnings that were done in Zacatecas, Mexico, in Brasilia, Brazil, and, and really benefit from it in a meaningful way. And by the way, it's all there in a toolkit. You can pick and choose what you think works for you and apply it what works for you in your municipality. And we've translated that into different languages, but that sense of scale is what this is really about. So it's great to make an impact in Zacatecas, Mexico, and that's really good. But really what we can provide is how do we make that impact scalable worldwide? I want to talk a little bit about the future and we can kind of sort of end here and, and looking at the next part of, of the study and, and and further down the line and, and maybe what what is success right and that's can be difficult to gauge and but but when you look at when the when the dollars are spent right and the research is done like what does success look like what does the ongoing investment perhaps look like after everything is done and, and then is this something that you think will 
keep being reinvested in, right? Like anything else. I mean, it's going to take time. It's going to take learnings, cultures change, uh, technology changes, consumer habits change. So what does the, I guess the future look like from, you know, safe drinking and, and looking at, you know, how alcohol affects society and how it can be improved from, you know, investing as a company, right? Which is a different thing. This is a bit abnormal that big companies now are looking at ways that they impact society, both negatively and positively and, and trying to adjust. Like, what does the future look like after sort of this stuff is, is sort of completed? It's, it's really the right question, right? Because, and, and let me answer it the following way, right? This isn't some sort of, we've set up a pot of money and we're going to go dole it out to charities right. around the world to make an impact. Man, we're doing this because it's good for us. Mm -hmm. Right. We're doing this because it's good for our brands. We know that our consumers, particularly, right, the consumers who are 21 up in the U.S. and 18 plus in the rest of the world, we know that those consumers look to the brands that are making a difference. We know that those consumers, when we get our brands right and when our brands run these types of programs, when our brands are doing these type of social norm advertising, man, it's good for the brand. We study that as well. It's good for brand affinity. It's good for brand purchase. You know, this isn't this isn't charity for us, right? This is about a new way of business. This is for us is about a new way, right, of thinking about what it is about our version of capitalism, our version of community capitalism. What does that mean, right? What does that mean for us going forward? So I think it's inevitable that we're going to do more and more of this because, frankly, I think it works, right? I think it really works. I think it's what consumers want. And by the way, it's what our own colleagues, 164,000 of us around the world <laughs> are energized to do. This is what we want to do as well. We want to be involved in this. We want to have this type of influence. So, you know, I think it's about scaling this up, but it's about doing it better and doing it more. And the way you do that is you drive that consumer insight, right? And you say, you know what? Here is a low alcohol product that's available, right? Here is what we're going to take our packaging, right? That, you know, think of the shrink wrap on a package or, mm -hmm. or, or, or the cardboard that comes in a case of beer. Yeah. You know, what are we using that for? Well, now we're starting to use that to get our social norm messaging out, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're using that social norm messaging to have that connection with the consumer so they have a positive impact, not just in their own lives, but with us. We think that's truly a competitive advantage. So I never want to portray this as somehow this is like, you know, the, 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 the charity tray is coming along and we're putting a few dollars in it. Man, mm -hmm. this is good for us, right? And that's why it's so important for us. And that's why we think of it as a competitive advantage. We think that this is the future, that we need to do this. That's the message of the day, that this is good for the company. Mm -hmm. So we at Georgetown, we call it doing well by doing good. In other words, uh, they're basically creating uh, financial success for the company and for its shareholders by creating social success for the rest of us. And they've laid out this, this big, hairy, audacious goal. They're going to take all these learnings, uh, all these best practices, and, um, and implement them go globally. You, you couldn't ask for a bigger challenge than that. And I think, you know, I think and I hope they're up to it been fascinating to chat with you guys and, and kind of dig a little deeper in just to the thought process on, you know, what goes into to something like this and, and a change in philosophy, you know, for, for a global company is really difficult to do. And it, it, it takes time, but it takes these small steps to get it right. I think John alluded to that is, is, is that you want to get it right. You know, if you're going to invest this much time, human capital and financial capital to something like this, you want to do it right. So I think baby steps, right? And then you get into to long walks and runs, and then you're, you're hit the ground running marathon. So appreciate taking the time. Hopefully the, the report and the data keeps coming back and keep improving, you know, change a company at scale is, is hard, but a worthwhile endeavor. So good luck. Grant, thanks so much for having us. And it's always great to send, send some time with Bill and, and really appreciate the questions as well, because it really got to sort of why it is we're doing this and what it is we're doing. Uh, and, and also for me, you know, this idea of the evidence. So thank you so much.